Beloved in Christ, grace to you and peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What if in this story, Jesus actually means that God cares about real things, like money? After all, he uses a financial transaction as the chief image in this story. He describes a farmer who hires workers to bring in the harvest, workers who were hired at different times during the day, workers who end up all being paid the same. Most of us were taught that in this parable, Jesus is speaking of those who come to faith early and work as disciples all of their lives for many years, compared with those who might, on their deathbed, finally look to God for hope of God's love. This interpretation says that God's grace and love are complete for all, even for that one who might not turn toward home until the last moments of life. But I know you, my family at Mount Olive. You don't need this parable to teach you what you already deeply believe, that God's grace is for all of God's children, latecomers or long workers. But if we turn this parable like a jewel in the light and focus on the image of money Jesus uses, we see a truth about God's reign hidden here Jesus also wants us to see. A truth about the economy, about how God desires the world to work. To see this, let's imagine God is the vineyard owner. There are ways to read the parable where we are the owners in the story, or we're the ones who are the long hours workers, or we're the workers who stood idle all day and received the grace both of being hired and a full day's pay for an hour's work. But here, let's consider God as the vineyard owner. If this parable might actually be about wages, that suggests that God's intent, God's generosity, is that the economy of this world is one where everyone, without exception, has what they need to eat. A roof over their heads, a meal, on the table has all they need for life. This is not how our world works, is it? We can't even agree on a fair minimum wage in this country to ensure that all who work earn enough to feed those who depend on them. We're seeing a steady attempt to dismantle structures we even have to care for the health of all people or to ensure that those who are too old to work receive money to live. Most people can't see this parable as speaking about the actual economy because it seems ridiculous. Argument after argument is made how this just isn't sustainable, how the world doesn't work that way. But none of those arguments matter to us if God wants the world to work that way. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? The owner asks. If we imagine the owner as God, that question weighs heavily on those who want to follow God's way. God has provided a world with abundant resources, enough for all, that's not disputed. But humanity has largely decided that God doesn't get to choose what we do with God's resources. Our systems are not built with generous love and capacity at their core. They're built for strict rules about how to make money, rewards to accumulate for ourselves, to build up treasures at the expense of others. I know. This is uncomfortable ground for those of us who have money set aside. You might value that you've worked hard, that you've put away some money, and are reluctant even to consider that God might hope for something else. 
it would be easier to spiritualize this parable and say, of course it's not about the economy. It's not about money. The problem is, hearing this with real money and the real economy in mind resonates with everything the Bible says about God's view of wealth and poverty, abundance and scarcity. God constantly calls us to live justly, feed those who are hungry, care for those who lack. God never says in the Bible, build up more barns for yourself, make sure you're taken care of. So God happily saying in this parable, everybody gets to eat tonight, everybody gets a day's wage, is exactly what we expect God to say. So, if you and I wish to be faithful to Christ here, what can we do? First, imagine living with a belief in God's abundance for all. Manna for everyone to live on. Wages that make sure everyone eats and has shelter and clothing. If that's what God chooses to do with what belongs to God, consider how can you be part of the plan, not one of the grumblers or hoarders? Second, imagine how to learn what's enough for you to live. In both the manna story and Jesus' parable, there is one clear standard. What do you need for today? When some of the Israelites tried to save more manna than they needed for that day, they found it rotten. Vineyard workers all got a full day's wage regardless. If what God chooses to do with what belongs to God is ensure that every single child of God has what they need for today, what does that mean for you, for your decisions? Third, since you want to follow Christ, when arguments rise up in you against an economic understanding of God's will, as they can in all of us, you could make an effort to set them aside. It's far easier to find reasons that won't work in the real world than to imagine what God might call all of us to do. So. You could practice the discipline of setting aside your gut-level objections and letting the Spirit open your mind and your heart to new possibilities. Don't be frightened, though. You are not asked to find all the answers all at once. Jesus wants parables to stick to us, roll around in our mind and imagination, let this one do that. Ponder it. Hold it in your heart. See where it brings you in the next weeks, months, years. Because if you want to follow Christ on this path to economic justice for all people, a society where everyone is cared for and has what they need to live, a world where all the nations of the world share equally in the resources of the earth, Remember, Christ calls you to follow a path, not instantly arrive at a destination. Baby steps are still steps. You and I can learn this together, follow Christ together, and that in itself is faithfulness. And remember the main point of this story. The holy and triune God is abundantly generous, and that includes you. You learned that at the cross, saw it in the empty tomb, know it in the Spirit's breath in your heart. Here, your faltering steps, trying to be faithful, are welcome to God because you are starting to choose what God chooses. When you stumble, God's abundant love and forgiving grace wash over you and lift you up. 
There is enough for everyone on this earth. Everyone gets to eat every day. Everyone has a place to sleep. Everyone has what they need to live. That's what God chooses for what belongs to God. Are you envious of this generosity? Or might you, living as Christ, want to find the delight of doing this with the triune God for the life of the world? In the name of Jesus.